I'll um, pass, pass over to Martin. Okay, so I'll just start with a short, it's more of a reflection than a prayer, I suppose, um, which might help us orientate our understanding of what it means, why, why, what the significance of being willing to risk going to prison uh, for conscience, for truth, for the gospel, uh, for the implications of the gospel might mean. And this is called Love Beyond Suffering. Mark ends his gospel account of the crucifixion by quoting an army officer who was standing there in front of the cross. The officer cries out, this man was really the son of God. The suffering of the cross is not meant for itself, but for something else. Christ does not suffer because suffering is in itself a value, but because love without restraint requires suffering. It is not a love for suffering which Christ reveals, but a love which prevails in suffering. It is not the physical death of Jesus which is redemptive, but the love of Jesus for us, even unto death. The death of Jesus reveals to us how absolute God's love is. God's love is conditionless, expressing itself even to the point of ultimate donation in death. We are saved not by the physical death of Jesus, but by the absoluteness of a love which did, which did not count death too high a price. The love of Jesus is redemptive in its absoluteness and victorious communicative in the resurrection. The crucified Jesus is a sign that Christian love lives in a threatened situation. He shows us that if we accept all the circumstances of love, love may suffer, but it overcomes. The man of faith has found hope stronger than history and a love mightier than death. I think those words speak for themselves and hopefully it's clear what their relevance is to what, what I'm about to say. So why are we talking about prison? Firstly, because risking time in prison is something that some of us, at least, have already judged to be a necessary response to the climate and environmental emergency. Secondly, because if that, if that is something we're going to experience, reflecting on the experience from the perspective of faith, to try to make some deeper sense in that difficult time, of that sacrifice can hopefully give us strength to face up to it, to risk it, and to come through it with our faith and our humanity strengthened, not diminished. And thirdly, with the hope that by sharing our reflections in faith and love, we can encourage and inspire others not to be afraid to take the risks required to help bring about the enormous, deep, drastic and urgent ecological, spiritual and political conversion that is required in these times. I think it's worth saying that 
in a society without, without the death penalty or physical torture, for example, through eviction, imprisonment is the worst punishment the authorities can impose. And of course, our prisons are much more hospitable than prisons in traditional societies that Jesus and the first Christians would have known, as well as in many other countries today. But of course, there are a lot more, a lot more people in prison in our societies. In this sense, to be in prison for reasons of faith and conscience is, in my understanding, a very literal way of following Jesus of taking up the cross to Jesus or of following the way of the cross. If we do it, we do it, we do it in some sense as a participation in Jesus' suffering for the salvation of the world. It's not up to us to save the world. God in Jesus has done that already. But as Christians, we are called to follow the Christ, to be part of his body, to participate in his mission. We are seeing the effects of sin on God's earth very visibly these days. And in sharing his suffering, we can share too in his saving mission. I'm going to run through some biblical references to experiences of prison and cap captivity. First of all, in the Old Testament. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to say I haven't got any slides, I'm afraid. This was a bit of a last minute. Uh, put together this talk. You just have to put up with uh, watching me. Anyway, there are not too many references to prison in the Old Testament as far as I know. Others may be aware of some that I miss. In the book of Genesis, Joseph was in prison for probably about 12 years after being sold into Egypt by his brothers and unjustly accused of making unwanted sexual advances. In prison, he was given or acquired the gift of interpreting dreams. We could perhaps say of understanding reality correctly. This is a theme I'll come back to. God used the trials Joseph endured to bring about something good. Quote, the saving of many lives, including those of his brothers who'd hated him so much as it says in Genesis chapter 50. The next most obvious reference isn't until Isaiah. In those words in chapter 61, quoted also by Jesus in Luke 6, as part of the manifesto for Jesus' mission. In Isaiah's words, the spirit of the Lord God is on me, who has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted, to soothe the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and release those in prison, to proclaim a year of favour of our God. Perhaps this expression of the desire to release those in prison is one of the roots of Christian concern for prisoners and ex-prisoners. The prophets, of course, generally were often in trouble with the authorities, both the rulers and the religious leaders or their proclamation of the words of God. The closest I'm aware of one of them being put in prison is that of Jeremiah, when in chapter 38, he's put down a well. In this case, the nature of the place he's put seems to be the punishment rather than the loss of freedom, as he's sinking into the mud and will die from starvation when there's no more food in the city if he is left there. When I was in prison for a plowshares action about 20 years ago, someone sent me a slightly cartoonish postcard picture of Jeremiah down a well. The image reminded me of a dungeon. I think it was supposed to. That's probably the, a dungeon is probably the closest image we have of a traditional prison. Interestingly, and perhaps not unlike what might be our own situation, Jeremiah's plight excites different reactions from different parts of the establishment. The chief men who have him thrown down there, sorry, the chief men have him thrown down there, but the foreigner, Ebed Melech 
the Kushites, is sympathetic, reports the situation to the king who has him brought up, seeks his advice and then protects him. A situation perhaps similar to some of the stories in the Book of Acts, where again, different parts of the establishment react differently. Something St. Paul deliberately exploited and maybe something we can learn from. In the book of Daniel, Daniel and his friends were imprisoned, you'd say, in the fiery furnace. And then later in the lion's den. Both of these trials have been used by Christians to interpret their experience of captivity and of being in prison. For bit, uh, for being faithful to their understanding of the implications of their faith and of the gospel. They've seen the experience of being in prison as a time of testing, a time of being tried by fire, a time of being in the lion's den, a real testing, a faithfulness to God, of putting their trust in God to keep them safe and protect them from both moral as well as physical dangers. And the moral dangers, including compromise over the principles that brought them there. And also with a sense that the pressures of prison life could lead to a failure to live up to a, a Christian way of life while inside prison. Others have used, other Christians who've been in prison for conscience and faith have used the imagery of the New Testament that is closely related to Daniel the apocalyptic imagery of being in the belly of the beast, being in that all consuming and closed, and sometimes literally, sometimes metaphorically dark environment, which is at the heart of the system, totally controlled by the system, such a controlled place where the system is in total control, it would appear. It is easy to think in that way that you are really in the belly of the beast. And this imagery seems to me also relevant because prison is a place where so much sin is concentrated, both social and personal, or at least the consequences of sin, the sin of society as well as of individual. And it has this in common with many of the world's marginal places. Everyone in a sense is a victim. And of course, the New Testament is full of references to prison and captivity. At least four of Paul's letters are traditionally called prison epistles, in the sense that they're under, it's understood that prison was that Paul was under arrest, house arrest, or in, in prison while he was writing them. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. In the Acts of the Apostles, the disciples are in prison a number of times. But to start with the gospel. In, the gospel, in Luke's gospel, chapter 21, there's what you might call an apocalyptic discourse of Jesus, where he says, many will come using my name. He's talking about uh, a situation of war. Refuse to join them, for the end is not so soon. And instead, you'll be seized and persecuted and imprisoned, brought before kings and governors to bear witness, and your perseverance will win you your lives. But of course, we know there are many examples where that last bit doesn't seem to happen in the normal sense of life on this earth. We can only trust in God and look to the fullness of eternity to see the full truth of Jesus' words there for those who don't come through. Very similarly in Matthew chapter 24, it's a very similar apocalyptic discourse from Jesus. And in chapter 25, the fact the last judgment scene of the sheep and the goats, Jesus says, when did you, we see you sick or in prison and go to see you? It's interesting that those in prison are equated with the sick. It's often a result of poverty, not least in the case historically of debtors' prisons, 
and a desperation to survive for those in uh, destitution. Dorothy Day, founder of the Catholic Worker Movement, was arrested, who was arrested about 10 times in her life uh, and spent times in prison for her witness, quoted this text and the works of mercy derived from it in the Catholic Worker tradition, in the Catholic tradition rather, and said that the best way to visit the prisoner is to go to prison. We know there are many examples in the Book of Acts of the uh, early Christians being in prison. Chapter four, Peter and Paul. And of note, it says, as soon as they were released, they went to the community and told them everything. Maybe there's some advice for us there too. In chapter five, the apostles were arrested and put in the public jail, but the angel of God led them out at night and enabled them to escape and told them to start preaching the message. Maybe there's something there for us too. Often angels in the acts uh, rescue uh, the, the prisoners. And maybe we, we are also called to use the opportunity to speak the message. Saul in chapters eight and nine, first of all, is putting Christians in prison and then he's asking for letters to authorize him to arrest followers of the way. I'm sure that was on his mind after his conversion experience and his willingness to be arrested and imprisoned. Chapter 12, Herod had James, the brother of John beheaded, went down to arrest Peter as well and put him in prison. And again, the angel opened the gates for Peter to escape, although he thought it was a dream until the angel left him. Chapter 16, Paul and Silas were flogged and put in prison in Philippi, whether as in all the other occasions too, they were praying and singing God's praises, a recurring theme in both Acts and Paul's letters. And there was an earthquake that made all the doors of the prison fall open. And maybe at times there are other kinds of earthquakes that can happen, social and political earthquakes, which could let the doors of prisons fall open for people of conscience. At this time, they, they and the other prisoners could have escaped, but instead Paul called the jailer who was converted along with his family. And this message of conversion too is part of the, what it means to be in, to risk prison. And Paul insisted on being released from prison, on being heard by the magistrates. He wanted to release him quietly. He didn't want them to get away with keeping it quiet. He wanted to make the most of the opportunity. And he was in custody in two, for two years in Caesarea when he had opportunities to, ex to explain his faith his beliefs, his concerns to the governor and the king, to argue his case to others, to stay in touch with other disciples before using his status as a Roman citizen to have his case heard by the emperor. Paul knew how to cash in his privilege to spread his message, even at, as it turned out at the risk to his own life. sent to Rome under house arrest in chains to a Roman soldier to prevent escape. He continued to preach his message, as he said elsewhere in one of his letters, proud of his weaknesses, proud of his powerlessness, perhaps we could say. The fact that so much of the scriptures of the New Testament were written from prison perhaps tells us something that prison can be a great place to understand what's going on in the world, great place to understand our faith and especially the scriptures. Maybe that's why there seem to be so many angels in them, so many who seem to learn to interpret dreams, to interpret the nightmares of the societies and the rulers of the times and places where they live. Of course, there have been Christians in prison as well as executed and tortured for their faith 
all through Christian history, unfortunately, often, including by other Christians. I'm sure none of us are advocating that. Many Quakers at the time of the Reformation, I think were imprisoned for conscientious objection. More recently, in the 20th century, in particular, I think some were uh, imprisoned for absolute objection during World War I, World War II. It's interesting that the prison reforms brought about the idea that prisons could be placed, were very theoretical, I think, but the idea that it could be reformatories or penitentiaries, and to use the American term, places to do penance, where penance was understood as a practice, in this case, not voluntary, but imposed, that would lead to moral reform, becoming a better person. Perhaps that's something for us in it, rather than for the others in the prisons. At least some Victorian era prisons were designed to be similar to monasteries. It's no accident that like monasteries, prisons have cells, regular hours and meals. And as far as, I, and in the past, not, no longer, they used to have early mornings and early nights with lights out. It's not the case now. It's probably these similarities, along with the understanding that the margins, and especially prisons perhaps, are great places to get the right perspective on our societies and scriptures and faith. Probably those that led to some Christians, including Catholic workers in the US in the 50s and 60s, to talk about prisons as the new monasteries. That probably sounds unrealistically romantic. I think it certainly does. It's probably more real if you're in a prison the hold of your Christian friends in a certain type of the more comfortable American prison. Fairly rare. But there is something in it. Not that prison is a healing place, good to become a holy person in that way. Because in fact, in my experience, survival in terms of keeping good mental health, for example, is a challenge. But because the monastic movement did is indeed start as a place as a movement to the margins, away from comfortable Christianity. And also because the inactivity of prison life does at least in theory, give the potential to, for example, study the Bible and to pray more intensely. Even to do these things together with others, if we are lucky enough to be there together. It also gives that marginal perspective on society from where the Bible was mostly written. And to be in that marginal place, not as a helper or a social worker or a minister of religion or to do good, but come, not to be coming in from above with our choice and our freedom in each moment to give up our privileges and freedom. Not coming in that way, but as people almost equally powerless with those we are sharing the space and the time with. Because we will have entered upon a change of events that may now be out of our actual control. Not perhaps the same as when we're on remand, but when we're convicted. At the mercy as much, of every, as, as, much as everyone else of the system, which as the prison saying goes, you can't beat. On the subject of the new monasticism, it was, of course, in prison that Dietrich Bonhoeffer penned those words, including the ones about seeing faith from the underside of history. And it was in prison, to state the obvious, that Martin Luther King wrote his famous letter from a Birmingham jail. And, Mar and Nelson Mandela started writing Long Walk to Freedom, Freedom on Robben Island. One of the strange things about being in prison is that just by being there, not necessarily doing anything, it can be a very powerful and significant act. As Phil Berrigan said, prison speaks to conscience, as does the willingness, all willingness to suffer voluntarily for what is right, I believe. It's not just the disruption that can create, which Disruption can create an external power that can bring about change. 
sacrifice can bring about a conversion of conscience, which ultimately perhaps is deeper and more lasting and profound. For some, at times, it can be useful to see a stay in prison in a sense as a retreat, an opportunity to pray more intensely, to study the Bible from that reality, that perspective, to read about the realities of the world we live in, to reflect on what we're experiencing there and what it tells us about our society. Somebody said how we treat prisons tells us a lot about our society. How we treat prisons tells us a lot about our society. It is good when the opportunity ar arises to take a cue from the apostle to sing and praise God in captivity, even if quietly. It's good to take a cue from St. Paul and write lots of letters or articles from others on the outside to read. On the other hand, maybe it's at times best not to put any pressure on yourself. Do what the American Catholic worker Frank Cordaro calls easy time. But in a place where the pleasures of life are in short supply, often the best way is to try to give that life meaning, to act intentionally, to make it meaningful. And remember, when you're lying on your bunk, it really helps to be happy with whatever it was that you did that got you there. On a slightly different tack, during the Vietnam War, many Christians in the US went to prison camps as conscientious objectors. Some others went to prison itself as a result of anti-war protests. Those who were not conscripted or drafted and, and, and so did not risk that captivity for conscientious objection, saw this as a form of solidarity with those who were drafted, conscripted, and as being a necessary risk for those convinced that nonviolence was the solution to problems rather than the state violence of war. If soldiers were willing to risk their lives, other resistors had to endure prison. They saw it as being necessary to take similar risks. In a similar way that early 20th century pacifists had seen nonviolent action as the moral equivalent of war, as being willing to make similar sacrifices, being equally committed to the cause. Which reminds me of the words of Father Daniel Berrigan, the Jesuit. And I think we can apply these to our own cause too, the cause of uh, life on this planet, for all of us, especially the poorest. That we have, he said, we have assumed the name of peacemaker but we have been, by and large, are willing, unwilling to pay any significant price. And because we want the peace with half a heart and half a life and half a will, the war, of course, continues, because the waging of war by its nature is total, but the waging of peace by our own cowardice is partial. So a whole will and a whole heart and a whole national life bent towards war prevails over the mere desire for peace. We want peace, but, but most of us do not want to pay the price of peace. We, we have a dream of peace that has no cost attached. We have taken for granted that war shall exact the most rigorous cost and that the cost shall be paid with a cheerful heart. We take it for granted that in wartime, families will be separated for long periods, that people will be imprisoned, wounded, driven insane, killed on foreign shores. In favor of such wars, we declare a moratorium on every normal human hope, for marriage, for community, for friendship, for moral conduct towards strangers and the innocent. We are instructed that deprivation and discipline, private grief and public obedience are going to be our lot. And we bear with it, because bear we must. Because war is war, good or bad, and we are stuck with it. But what of the price of peace? Think of the good 
decent, peace-loving people. I think of the good, decent, peace-loving people I've known by the thousands, and I wonder how many of us are so afflicted with the wasting disease of normalcy that even as we declare for peace, our hands reach out with an instinctive spasm in the direction of our loved ones, in the direction of our comforts, our home, our security, our income, our future, our plans. That 25-year plan of family growth and unity, that 50-year plan of decent life and honourable demise, natural demise. Of course, let us have peace, we cry, but let us at the same time have normalcy. Let us lose nothing. Let our lives stand intact. Let us know neither prison nor ill repute, nor the disruption of ties. And because we must encompass this and protect that, and because at all costs our hopes must march on schedule, because it is unheard that the good should suffer injustice or families be sundered or good repute be lost. Because of this, we cry and cry peace and there is no peace. And there are no peacemakers and there are no makers of peace because the making of peace is at least as costly as the making of war, at least as exigent, at least as disruptive, at least as liable to bring disgrace and prison and death in its wake. We'll stop the recording there.